electronic power supplies. Number one, vacuum tube diodes. Electronic equipment such as a radio, television, or a hi-fi amplifier requires a DC voltage source to operate properly. Since most of these electronic devices that are used in the home are operated from a 110 volt AC source, this voltage must be converted or changed into a DC, direct current voltage. The process of converting AC to DC is called rectification and the device that does the changing is called a rectifier. In a rectifier, the electrons of an alternating current are prevented from reversing their direction of flow. Therefore, electron flow is in one direction only. Semiconductor diodes and vacuum tube diodes have this rectification characteristic and are classified as rectifiers. Therefore, the two terms diode and rectifier are used interchangeably. In the field of electronics, the diode is the simplest form of an electron controlling device. For many years, the only diode in common use was the vacuum tube diode. Recently, however, the development of the semiconductor diode with its small size and high efficiency has achieved widespread acceptance and is being used in numerous applications for rectification. At present, both types are in use, with each having specific applications where its advantages are required. Because of this, a technician should understand the principle of operation of both. Let's start with a vacuum tube diode and see how it works. A vacuum tube has a glass or metal envelope enclosing metal electrodes. The air is removed from the envelope, creating a vacuum. This is the schematic symbol for a directly heated diode tube. The word diode is the abbreviation meaning two electrodes. The electrode that emits electrons is the cathode. In a directly heated diode, the cathode is heated by an electrical current flow and is usually referred to as the filament. The electrode that collects the emitted electrons is called the anode or plate. The circle around the two electrodes represents the glass or metal envelope of the tube. A second common type of diode vacuum tube is the indirectly heated diode. As this schematic symbol shows, the cathode and filament are separate elements. In this arrangement, a piece of metal is placed between the plate and the filament. The filament heat raises the temperature of the cathode until it emits electrons. The filament is not considered as an electrode as it only provides the heat for the cathode and is therefore referred to as a heater. The basic requirement for all vacuum tubes is that there has to be a source of free moving electrons that can be used as a current flow. Electrons are found in every atom of every substance and a method is needed to drive them out and make them free moving. One process is known as thermionic emission. When a metal is heated, electrons in the atoms are accelerated in their random motion because of the added heat energy. With enough heat to make the metal glow, some internal electrons gain enough velocity to break away from the surface of the metal. The electrons can be considered as boiled off the surface. The electrons that escape into the region around the cathode are known as the space charge. This cloud of electrons has a negative charge, and as it builds up, the space charge becomes more negative than the cathode. As a result, the space charge repels any additional negative electrons back into the cathode. Let's analyze this simple circuit to observe some of the characteristics of a diode tube. The filament of the tube is being directly heated from a battery source. In the plate circuit, a milliameter is connected in series with a plate voltage source. When the plate is more negative with respect to the cathode, no current flows from the cathode to the plate. Remember, like charges repel each other. Therefore, the negative plate repels the negative charged electrons. When the plate and cathode are at the same potential, as illustrated by removing the battery from the plate circuit, the plate neither attracts nor repels the electrons. The current is still zero. As soon as the plate becomes positive with respect to the cathode, some of the negative electrons in the space charge are attracted to the plate. 
current will flow from the cathode to the plate. If the plate voltage is doubled, the current flow through the tube is also doubled. As long as the plate is positive with respect to the cathode, every change in plate voltage causes a corresponding change in plate current. The plate voltage can be increased until the plate is attracting the electrons as fast as the cathode can emit them. The milliammeter in the plate circuit indicates a very large current flow. If the plate voltage is further increased, there is no increase in current. At this point, the tube is said to be saturated, as the cathode is emitting all the electrons that it can. If the filament voltage is now increased above its normal value, this will enable the cathode to emit more electrons. With the same high plate voltage as before, a larger plate current will flow. If the filament voltage is reduced, the plate current is decreased. The cathode cannot emit as many electrons as normal. In practice, the filament voltage is not varied. Changes in plate current are achieved by changing the value of the plate voltage only. However, after a tube has been in operation for some time, the cathode's emission decreases, which has the same effect as reducing the filament voltage. The vacuum tube diode, therefore, acts like a one-way switch. That is, it lets current flow in one direction only. The diode allows electrons to pass through it only when the plate is positive with respect to its cathode. When the electron flow is from the cathode to the plate, the switch is closed. When the plate is negative with respect to its cathode, no electrons can pass through it. The switch is open. It is this one-way switch action that gives a diode its rectifying ability. Now let's look at the construction of a directly heated vacuum tube. The heater is a tungsten wire that will give off intense heat when an electrical current flows through it. The heated filament will emit the electrons to form the space charge. The plate or anode is usually made of iron, nickel, or molybdenum and is placed over the filament. The plate surrounds but does not touch the filament. This allows the electrons emitted from the filament to be attracted and collected by the plate. The glass envelope is now placed over the electrodes and the air is exhausted. This vacuum is necessary to prevent the heated filament from oxidizing and to prevent the air molecules from interfering with the flow of electrons. To improve the vacuum in a tube, a magnesium getter compound is placed inside and the entire assembly is sealed and heated. The resultant chemical action of the vaporized magnesium removes any final traces of gas in the tube. After the tube cools off, the vaporized getter condenses on the inside, forming the silvery film usually seen on glass tubes. The tube shown is a 5U4 dual diode. In some diagrams, the leads entering a tube envelope are marked by letters. These letters represent the part to which the leads connect. For example, in the indirectly heated diode on the left, P stands for plate, H stands for heater, and K is used for the cathode. Note, although the word cathode begins with the letter C, this letter is not used because it is the standard letter symbol for capacitor. The filament in the directly heated diode on the right is usually labeled F. Connections are made to the tube elements by metal pins that extend through the bottom or base of the tube. This plug-in base fits into a socket which is permanently wired into the circuit. Since vacuum tubes have a relatively short life as compared to other components used in electronic equipment, this method of easy removal and replacement is required. Although there are many special types of sockets in use, most of the vacuum tubes used in electronics require one of the eight sockets illustrated. This is one method of classifying a vacuum tube by the type of socket required. The pin numbering system is shown and refers to the bottom side of the socket since the wiring is done on that side. For example, this is a seven pin miniature. Notice that the pins are numbered from one to seven in a clockwise direction, starting with the pin after the wide gap. 
Since the tube socket has a matching alignment of holes, the gap makes it impossible to place the tube into its socket in the wrong position. Tubes that are larger than miniature types may be manufactured with either glass or metal envelopes. These tubes are called octals. They have eight pins and an aligning plug with a key that extends from the base of the tube to help guide the tube into its socket. Viewed from the base, the octal tube pins are numbered one through eight in a clockwise direction from the key. The pins are spaced evenly around the base of the tube, but the key fits into a corresponding opening in a socket so that the tube may be inserted in only one position. Tubes are also identified by a code combination of numbers and letters marked on the envelope. For example, this tube is identified 5Y3. The first number, 5, represents the filament voltage. The letter Y is a manufacturer's code, and the last number, 3, represents the number of elements in the tube. Let's look at another tube. This one is marked 35W4. What is the filament voltage, and how many elements are in the tube? You're right. The filament voltage is 35 volts, and there are four elements in the tube. The dimensions, schematic symbol, base pin arrangement, and characteristics of a vacuum tube can be found in published manuals, such as this receiving tube manual. The tubes are listed in numerical order. Let's look at the information provided for the 5Y3G, or GT tube. This tube is classified as a full-wave vacuum rectifier used in power supply of radio equipment having moderate DC requirements. The schematic symbol and base pin arrangement is shown, as well as the maximum ratings. For example, the peak inverse plate voltage is 1400 volts maximum, and the peak plate current is 440 milliamps. Typical operation values are given when used with a capacitor input to filter, and when used with a choke input to filter. The receiving tube manual may also be used as a condensed textbook or reference. There is a section devoted to the operating principles of vacuum tubes, their characteristics and applications. In addition to numerous typical circuit diagrams using vacuum tubes. In the next film, semiconductor theory and the operation of a PN junction diode is explained. How to test a semiconductor diode using an ohmmeter is demonstrated, and the use of a substitution manual is shown.